So we are now uh, going to be at <clears throat> Leslie Buck's Garden in Berkeley. So Leslie may be best known as the author of her New York Times reviewed garden memoir, Cutting Back, My Apprenticeship in the Gardens of Kyoto. When she studied with one of the oldest and most highly acclaimed landscape companies in Japan. During this time, Leslie pruned while precariously balanced on bamboo poles lashed on high branches. And she worked through thunderstorms, freezing downpours, and even an earthquake. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this engaging book. So this is Leslie's before a photo of her own garden in Berkeley. And here is the after. Leslie is an aesthetic pruner. She has worked as an aesthetic pruner in the Bay Area for more than two decades. And she welcomes the opportunity to work in native plant gardens. If you have one and need some pruning work, you can contact Leslie on her website at lesliebuck.com. This is the back garden before photo. And this is the back garden after. So Leslie used Japanese garden design principles to design this charming garden, which was created with the intention of attracting, housing, and feeding wildlife. The garden contains 90% native plants. Uh, the creation of the colorful front coastal garden and this peaceful back woodland garden was done on a tight budget by purchasing tiny plants, scavenging recycled concrete, and scouting for used furniture. The back garden was designed to allow this, the visitor to enter a scene found in nature, in this case a forest, ringing a blue-eyed grass meadow with an adjacent pond. This is the other side of Leslie's yard. It's the campsite where Leslie likes to sit and have tea. Among the casualties of the cancellation of this year's actual garden tour, was the opportunity for you to enjoy tea and homemade scones in Leslie's garden. She had generously offered to make these available as a fundraiser for the tour. As it is, we'll have to enjoy our garden tea time virtually with this photo of a native rose and a cup of tea served in a teacup from Leslie's mother's trousseau. So let's go now to see Leslie in her garden. And we're actually in good luck here because this is Leslie Zander, who, uh, whose garden we saw last week, and she has come to film Leslie Buck in her garden this week. So Leslie Zander, we have kind of a blurry photo here. Mm -hmm. Let's see if it'll come into focus a little better. Hi, everybody. Welcome, um, Kathy. Hi, Leslie. How are you? It's Our, nice to see you. Can you hear my? Hi, Kathy. I can. Welcome. Right. Go ahead. Welcome, everyone, to my garden. And I, as you can hear, I'm in a very urban area. Um, there's a siren going by. I hear that in the evenings. Sometimes there's speeding cars and um, there's a lot of bicyclists and we have a walker going by. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted just to say hi real fast to those near and far who support native gardens and especially those on my um, nature Instagram posts far and near. Um, this garden, which is based on nature and has really helped me get through this period. And that's why I wanted to, to show it to you. Um, I think we just might've had some <laughs> bikers go by. Um, as you know, I have trained in Japan and, and um, I have a book that I wrote, Cutting Back. And what I learned in Japan was um, gardens don't have to be just um, a show of flowers and a beautiful geometry, but they can also be a, a landscape that shows off a scene in nature. And what some of you may not know is that the gardens of Japan are about 99% native to Japan. All the 
plants they use are mostly native. And several landscapers told me, Leslie, when you come go home and build your own garden, please use plants local to your area and look for scenes local to where you live, not ours. So that's what I tried to do. And this is a big experiment for me, my first garden that is about five years old. And I planted everything one to three inches tall. So um, I wanted to mention that I'm mostly, I'm gonna show some plants, but I'm mostly gonna go over design. Um, and uh, one let, thing is, let me see. Oh, yeah? It's pretty blurry. Okay. So you might want to show your photos in the back garden where we might get better reception. Okay, we'll do that. So I will, con so yeah, make sure. Um, continuing, uh, just want to mention that um, how I designed this garden initially, it was a lawn, um, really it was a dead lawn. And um, I sheet mulched it, which means I just mowed down the grass, I threw cardboard on top, threw a bunch of mulch on it, waited a year, and then I planted in the winter. And that was very successful in getting rid of all the weeds, that waiting a year. And in the meantime, I did a lot of research and um, on my site, there's a really big resource list connected with my Leslie Buck garden um, that says how I built this and all the resources I used in case, you know, some of you are beginning. But what I did was I laid a hose down to create the central bed. And I looked at it from the upper windows. And I looked at it from here when I approach. And I also looked at it from my driveway when I got out of my car. Because what I wanted was, I didn't want to just, you know, bike up to my house and get off at the driveway. In Japan, sometimes you enter through a garden and it is a, it's a way to relax before you enter the house. So even though I'm in a really tiny spot, I wanted to feel like I was going through a forest. And because, you know, I have this huge palm tree that's probably a hundred years old. It was the only tree um, in my garden when I bought this house. Um, I decided to do a coastal garden in front with lots of flowers for the neighbor neighbors and the back garden is very different it's more of a forest garden um my goal let's go a little closer into the garden my goal for this garden was to have flowers year round not necessarily one plant flowering all the time This is an abutilon, which should flower uh, year round, but I more wanted a marathon relay race of flowers. So every season, I wanted winter, fall, summer, I wanted something in flower. And um, can you see okay, Kathy, if I showed pictures here? Can you see these? Uh it's pretty blurry. I think it might be better to show them in the backyard when okay. we can help to focus on them. Good, good. Um, so some of the, let's see, I'll just go over in my head. There's California fuchsia that blooms spectacularly in winter and then, um, or in fall. And then the fuchsia flowering current, it starts up in winter. And <laughs> we have a little phone. And then um, in summer, we have this uh, St. Catherine's lace, which is, you did see a photo of that earlier. It's just spectacularly white, covered. It is, it's, it is the queen of summer, I call it. Whereas the fuchsia flowering current is the, maybe it's the king of winter. Um, and, I, we're going to pass the golden current, and this may look kind of wild, but I have everything pruned here. 
Um, I prune it above so that I keep a view of the hills from my upper windows, but I keep it a little high. So I have privacy in the second story. And also I wanna walk through this. This isn't just a garden to quickly look at and walk past, it's a garden to walk through. And it's still very young. Um, so let's keep moving. Um, another uh, thing that I just wanna mention, you know, I thought about my plants for about three years and I am a professional pruner. I work in a lot of uh, hundreds of landscapes. And so I really had curated my list of plants. And I found that now five years later, successful half were moved and half were changed. So don't get too worried about keeping your original plan because plants as a pruner, I know that plants, they just do different things than you think them to do what you originally wanted. Um, really magical things can happen. Um, and yeah, and I, I just, there are a couple keystone plants here, such as the golden currant, the fuchsia flowering currant, and the ceanothus. Those are all these, what they call the super feeders that does import to me. Should we go on back or how is that, Kathy? I think it would be better if you went to the backyard. Yeah. Okay, let's go on back. Um, I'll keep talking. I listened to Doug Tellamy's talk about two years after I landscaped my garden. And I was really moved by what he said. I don't have children. So the, the idea of feeding mama birds, um, providing food that mama birds can feed to the young, um, really captivated me. And we're walking through the, uh, the food garden um, for my housemates and I, and we're heading back to the vegetable garden for wildlife. Um, because, well, I like to say people can go to the grocery store, but wildlife can't. So um, I was very taken by when Doug said three to, to six to 8,000 caterpillars to feed a nest. Um, I like to call it the 10k run like that's a lot of insects add some keystone plants to my garden and um i didn't quite have enough so a couple things i added let's see in the screen uh is i added some of the prunus alicifolia the holly leaf cherry and the um, and a couple others I'm going to discuss as we go along. But we're at the pond um, now. This is a bathtub, and I'll I'll go back to those I'll go back to those super feeders in a second. The Keystone. Um, we're at this pond, and after I had planted my garden, I thought, you know, I want a water element. And I didn't quite have the money for a stream or the, the technical know-how to do it myself. So I just did a bathtub and I put a suction cup, a huge suction cup in it. And, um, and I, uh, then I added this, I got a big rock and I had them drill a hole in it. And I put a $15 pump pipe up through that rock and the water trickles down and the rock is sitting on two rods that I got at a reuse store that I spray painted white. Um, I'm always just figuring out as I go along. And then I started putting plants around it because birds need to, what I learned slowly is birds need to slowly approach 
a pond, they need cover as they're approaching or they won't want to approach. Um, so we've been getting all sorts of birds since I had the plants get closer. And also this, um, this month, we actually have a frog that came and is now living in the pond. And it's daylight right now. And I'm glad you can see clearly. But um, imagine at night, everyone. Like, usually I hear sir my sirens, my speeding cars, occasionally gunshots. Um, but now we all hear this frog. It is just. It's not that loud. It's just so unusual. It's this ribbit, ribbit. I mean, he really wants to find a girlfriend. It's an, it's the exact call of a male chorus frog. And um, so if anybody knows of any girl frogs, send them over this way. Um, but he just goes on all night and all my neighbors just love it. They ask, you know, they say, is that your frog? And it, it makes everyone feel like we're in a forest. It's just uncanny. So I believe in landscaping in a way that looks like nature, but if you use natives, to, local natives to do that, it actually starts becoming living nature. Let's go more to the meadow. Maybe. So I built this garden as my favorite area in nature, which is meadow and a forest. And I thought the campfire uh, theme would be kind of playful and fun because um, in Japan, you know, you're often, you're picking any, a scene in nature. It could be a waterfall, it could be a stream, it could be a desert, but it's something that's familiar that helps you, that allows you to go there and, um, and not get too riveted by what you're seeing, but just to relax. So for me, that was the meadow and the forest, and maybe it's different for you. So I just thought maybe everyone could think about what's a place in nature that really captivates you? And what about that place could you put into a landscape? Because this isn't an exact, you know, replica of a meadow forest in the Berkeley Hills. There's a lot of plants from different areas. I'm more um, creating a scene that feels like that, that has the essence. So what you're looking at, because a lot of people, and we could probably, yeah. What you're looking at is a big meadow, super bloom of um, blue-eyed grass that I put in by seed from Larners. I got a huge amount of blue-eyed grass seed um, and spread it in different parts of the garden. And there's also blue dicks coming up right now. And I'd like to say I was very unsuccessful with bulbs the first three years because I kept putting California native bulbs near, uh, I have a little, air, little drip. So I kept putting them near water and they don't want water. <laughs> they want to be in dry areas. So they kept dying. So that now that I know to put them where there is no water, I've been a little more successful. There's ground cover Mahonia. There's this beautiful Mahonia Navinii that has thousands of yellow flowers and thousands of tiny, tiny berries that turn ruby and fall. And then there's the lupin in the middle that comes and goes. It's so ephemeral. And on the edges, I like to put evergreen plants to screen from neighbors. And then more inland, I like to have things that change over the seasons because what I want in a natural garden that is meant to reflect nature is I'm trying, I'm striving to show off season. Oh yes. You're going to say something, Kathy? No, I want to, I want to show off more uh, seasonal color than flower color. So instead of a lot of different flowers, I'm more looking at each season, there's something showing off. And last, every Sunday I do a post 
of my garden um, on my Facebook page and my Instagram, both are Leslie Buck author. And you can see my garden throughout the seasons. We can kind of swivel back if you want. And we passed Columbine. We're passing two big, there's the, I don't know if you can see the Columbine. This might be a good place to show a couple of photos. Because I want to show you there's a lot of seasonal color here. It's not necessarily just spring. And when you plant, I want you to plant for all the seasons, not just spring, because it makes your garden a place you want to go to year round. Um, this is something for one, it's the, the Douglas fir and everybody who passes this, they have to stroke it. So just a textural change is special. And in the front, you know, I wanted to, can you see this, Kathy, now? Yes, we can see it now. Great. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, so this is the amazing buckwheat, the grand, the big buckwheat, um, the St. Catherine's lace that, and then here is my California fuchsia that in fall, I'm telling you, all my neighbor's lawns go brown. And my California fuchsia is just raving red. So there's that. Got us. And here's the golden current that has just tons of beautiful yellow flowers. This does go deciduous, I'll have you all note, which is perfectly fine with me. I have plenty of little evergreens. The front, I want mostly evergreen because it is like a coastal. But I will front is almost all drought tolerant to zero water. I wanted to try and make it evergreen in the front and almost tropical looking with drought tolerance because I have a lot of pruning clients who won't do natives because they think they're too dry. And I'm like, drive by my house any time of the year and you will see things in flower and it'll look lush. Here's this. A uh, fuchsia flowering current, just spectacular. The hummingbirds go crazy over it. This has so many prickles. You have to find a spot that gets a little sun, a little shade, and is not near anyone, including you. Um, and but it is glorious. It's worth the pain. And in the meadow, here's the lupin that sometimes blooms. <laughs> summer and, and in this meadow color which is toyon toyon is really one of my favorite winter plants i was wondering if this might not i guess the berries might be a problem but really the birds get them so quickly um maybe a street tree for san francisco it's evergreen i get so much wind here um, no problem with the wind and it's very hardy. And I have seen Toyon, also called Christmas berry, in San Francisco near Golden Gate Park. But it has these gorgeous berries. And the cedar waxwings found my garden this year. I, I don't like using bird seed. I like just slowly trying to get the birds to come in. And boy, once they found this, they came every single day until they wiped those trees clean. It was very fun. The, the scrub jay didn't really care about the toyon berries until the waxwing cedars started eating them. And then suddenly the scrub jay was also like, no, I want some. Such a little competitive bird. <laughs> um, so what we're going to see, it's a little bright back there, but we're going to go into my secret nook where I have tea every morning. We could stay here for a second. And we're going to see redwood sorrel. And the, this is a real shade plant. Uh, no, we'll wait, we'll wait for this one. So if we're quiet, maybe we could hear the bees. They are going crazy over my coffee berries. Now, everything you see is pruned. I'm gonna do, sometimes to prune, I just pinch as I'm walking by. Just that'll keep it from growing out. I won't even have to prune it. So just pinch. I do this all the time because 
over there is where I sit and I have a housemate whose window is there and I want to have privacy. So it's really nice to create one area in the garden, I think, that's very private. So here you can see my, um, my fire pit area and at night with the evergreens surrounding the fence and everything when the lights go out and that fire's lit, I mean, it feels like you are at a campground somewhere maybe um, far away. And in the mornings, I love coming back here and Leslie, hi the audio is kind of tough where you are and you have about two more minutes. Little animals and so <laughs> um, you can see my little sitting area where we have, you know, the redwood sorrel, which it grows in pure shade. And you're looking at the pink flowering current, which is incredible in spring and also in fall and winter. And I am gonna go over a little bit. <laughs> the, the pink flowering current has these incredible berries. And behind me, we won't go over it, it is a rose that, and in winter, we have the pips. And here's fall dogwood. So let's come back out to finish. So I love, I almost love fall color the most. I love it when the leaves fall and they go on the ground and there's just, it's like a kaleidoscope of color. And um, my last Sunday, I showed the garden in winter and next Sunday, I'm gonna show uh, details of the frog pond. But if you can imagine, if you went around this corner and there's a red bud back there, um, and remember that the windows above, I prune everything. So I am screened from neighbors. Every window from a neighbor is screened by, by how I prune these trees. But if you go around the corner, last summer, um, we started hearing a cricket and we had not, I don't think anyone's heard a cricket in this area in 30 years. And I was like, where is that? And I went back there and lo and behold, it was right in this pile of twigs that is about three feet high that I had left. I call it my habitat nest. And it was meant, it's meant, this pile of twigs is meant to host beneficial insects. And it is exactly what it did. And we just opened our windows and listened to that cricket. It was just, it was like a symphony um, in the heart of an urban area. So I just wanna encourage everyone. I know there's some gung-ho gardeners out there and they want to get started right away. But I, I just want to remind everyone to always go out into your gardens and relax and create an area where you can relax. All you need is two evergreen shrubs, maybe a little rock, maybe a little deciduous plant, a fern, and you got a secret area. That's like 50 bucks. Um, so, Start, I say, start in a small area if you uh, want. Um, definitely start with sheet mulching. That saves, even if it's small areas or large. And um, maybe grab a relaxing book, <laughs> um, one about studying well, in Japan. But mostly I'm, go to your garden and, and make sure and take that time to enjoy what's there. So Leslie, thank you very much. We actually have time for a few questions. Oh, cool. Uh, so uh, um, some people asked, uh, someone said you have a great Facebook page and I think you're also on Instagram, is that correct? Yes, so I am, um, I'm on both Instagram and Facebook and I'm Leslie Buck author. And I mostly I only do nature posts. So that's why I have, especially on Instagram, I have people in England, 
I have people in Russia, in Japan, somebody in Mor a family in Morocco, and they're all interested in nature. So um, Instagram is really fun that way. Someone asked if you cut back the blue-eyed grass. Can you tell us how you manage it? I thank you for asking. I actually don't. I let the grass die down. I've several times I'm like, oh my gosh, is it not? Good? Is it going to work? I I let it go to seed, which provides free bird seed, and then about sixty percent kind of falls over, and there's always some green. You can see it in the dead of winter on my Facebook page for last Sunday's video. You can see what it looks like, but it just kind of dies down. And then in spring, it just pops back up and I don't rake it. Okay. I, I sometimes when it's growing, I have to push it. I just have to come in here and push it away from plants that I want to develop. Like that lupin would probably not be there if I hadn't pulled the, the blue-eyed grass away from it as it was growing. Um, but it just, it comes right back. So I have free mulch, I have free bird seed, and I have no mowing. I'm a garden pruner. I don't wanna do anything um, in my garden <laughs> mostly. So I hardly weed, because I, I plant a lot of ground covers. Um, and I also plant, so it gets almost exactly the height I want. And then I know aesthetic pruning. And I'd like to say that Merritt College has a great natural pruning program. So uh, Merritt College Horticulture School, if anybody wants to learn pruning, uh, check it out. Leslie, Any we other? have uh, just a minute more. Can you give us a little pruning demo, like show us how you make a pruning cut? Sure. Oh, you had um, your on your hip. <laughs> Let's see. I could probably do it. Where should I do it? Right here. I had a I had a good place back there, Kathy. Here, let's go over here. Sorry, everybody. We're gonna move a little bit to the um, this dogwood. I've been letting it kind of tumble down so you could see it. But look, I mean, it's completely in my way. So. When I make a natural pruning cut, I, I always got a little to audio, not frozen from some frozen video and an audio issue. Let's see if you can come back to us. Try got a little audio freezing going on. <clears throat> okay. Hey, I'll grab something. Is this better? It is a little better. Thank you. Okay. So how I want you to do it is if you just right now during spring, you know, I showed you the pinching. That helps. The smaller the cut, the less it's going to react. So if you can just keep it from getting too big, pinch it or cut to a leaf. See how you can see that stub. But if I cut to a flower, it goes away and then if I want to cut this in half if it's going in the path got a little video freeze there I, on my okay <laughs> you know why because it wants to say it want the video wants me to say on my website Leslie Buck author, there is a pruning video. I did a lecture for the um, California Native Plant Society of Saratoga. And um, it's a talk on what Japanese garden principles you can use in your native gardens. And it's also a basic of pruning video. So it shows these, you know, these cuts that then get hidden if you do them at intersections. So check out lesliebuckauthor.com and you will get more information. <laughs> is, is, that, is that a good answer? That was terrific. So um, Stephanie or Ethan, do you have any questions? Or wait, we just actually, we were waiting for Pete. We were having some- uh, Oh, and I kind of, the nice thing, of, oh, God. 
Well, we just and got our next uh, garden host connected. Okay. So I just want to say one last thing. You, Paul, remember, I'm sure, when we were having the rolling blackouts in the fires. And Leslie Buck was sweet enough to call me up one evening and say, Kathy, are you guys out of power? Because if you are, you and your family can come to my house and sleep over. So Aww. I just want to say one of my favorite parts of this job is getting to meet hosts and, you know, just getting to meet such great people. So Leslie Buck, thank you so much for this tour of your garden. It was lovely. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, too. And thank you, everyone. Okay. Enjoy. Before we say goodbye, I also want to thank Leslie Zander. So uh, Leslie Buck was having some AV problems and Leslie Zander, the host from last week, uh, very sweetly offered to come over and help her. So Leslie Zander has been filming Leslie Buck and they did not even know each other since yesterday. So again, it's just been really nice, like being yeah. able to work with such great hosts. So thank you very much, both Leslie's and we're going to push on now. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Leslie. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Leslie.